you keep asking about it. So today, Ross and I are going to talk about the mysterious world of two-factor authentication. This is something you hear about all the time, and people keep telling you you need it, but a lot of people don't know what it is. They don't know when you should use it and exactly how to use it. So hang around, and we'll talk about it on Secure Digital Life. This is a Security Weekly production. Welcome to Secure Digital Life. If your users are going to keep putting risky stuff on your machine, you're screwed. So, Tom can help us understand the, the complexity of blockchain. I was reading through the show notes, man. Oof. In binary, it would be 001. Uh, who cares? But <laughs> it's probably not significant anyway. You're like you're looking out through the howl dot, you know, like, oh. hey, Dave, Dave. It's like Sim, but with, you know, it would be like I Sim instead of only, AI. It's I. only. Are you working on earning your Security Plus certification? Earn your certification faster and smarter with Cybex. Their courses and guides are compiled with CompTIA approved content, providing you with the knowledge to be fully prepared on exam day. The Cybex Security Plus Gold course includes a partner to you pass guarantee. Users enjoy free course updates and repeats until you pass the Security Plus exam. Learn more and register for a free trial today at cybex.com slash go slash free trial. When you are ready to purchase, save 50% with code SECURITY50. Hurry, this offer ends December 31st. Accredited by Microsoft, Cisco, NetApp, Idle, Oracle, and EC Council, Quick Start delivers high-impact, low-cost IT training through its cognitive learning platform in multiple domains. With Quick Start, you get an ever-growing catalog of courses, self-paced courses offered through a monthly subscription, virtual classrooms offered through an annual subscription, peer-to-peer -peer learning, mentoring, official courses, certified instructors, hands-on labs, and more. For more information, visit www.quickstart.com. Use coupon code PAUL20 to get 20% off on all cybersecurity courses. Quick start, creating world-class technologists. Only you can join us for our webcast with Signal Sciences entitled, Which Way Should You Shift Testing in the SDLC? That webcast will be held November 8th from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time if you go to securityweekly.com slash signal sciences to register now. And if you're interested in quality over quantity, and having meaningful conversations instead of just a badge scan, be sure and join us April 1st through 3rd at Disney's Contemporary Resort for InfoSec World 2019, which should be a lot of fun, where you can connect and network with like-minded individuals in search of actionable information. Use the registration code oh, OS19-SECWEEK for 15% off the main conference or the World Pass. InfoSec World is cool. It's inside of Disney World. We had fun last year, so we'll be there, so you should have a good time and plan to come. Um, all right. Hi, Russ. You, you're here. Hey, Doug. Well, I'm, I'm remote today. So oh, you're in the like Shamalama ding dong room or whatever that is. Yeah. And, and yeah, it's, it, it, it's looking better. Yeah, it's getting better. I've got some of the Philips Hue installed right now and uh, but need more outlets, believe it or and not. So I'll imagine that in a building built in the 70s, you need more outlets and, and <laughs> I, the shelves are creating like a weird 2001 kind of <laughs> all the white is like 2001 sort of thing. Yeah, very sterile. But well, I'll fix that. Trust me. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. I, I like it though. It's it's very. It, it looks like you're in like the med bay or something. So yep. it's like yep. Ru Russ, Russ. What do we do with these leeches and parasites we picked up on this alien planet? Eat them. <laughs> At Riker picked up on this alien planet because you know if anybody's <laughs> gonna pick up leeches and parasites, it's gonna be him. Especially with all his trips to Ryza. So. Uh -huh, yeah, we all know about that. We know what stuff happens on Ryza stays on Ryza, yeah. except for the stuff you bring back. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, so today we're talking about two-factor authentication. And basically the traditional way that everybody has been identifying themselves for years and years and years is with some sort of ID, so a user, what they call a username, and some sort of password, which is two things that get entered into a database on a system. And basically almost all this stuff was designed back in the like 60s and 70s when they were designed for people that were dialing in or connecting through terminals into mainframes. So they usually had fixed length fields 
I mean, although everything ultimately has a fixed length field, unless you want to get into like metaphysical programming or something. So it has a fixed length field. And there were not only were there programming language restrictions, there were database restrictions and even just plain old fashioned design restrictions where people didn't even think about or they did think about and said it's better to save space than to use long numbers. And in fact, even today, you will see if you go out in the world, four digit pen numbers. I, I'm sure Russ has seen a four digit pen number somewhere. I sure have my bank, for instance. Oh, I know. I mean, what bank is that, Russ? <laughs> I'm not telling. Oh, uh, okay. Well, I'm just going to check. But I mean, you still see that. I, I remember for years, and they did fix it. But Delta Airlines required you to have a four-digit PIN number uh, for their system, and I and I called them and said, "This is ridiculous. You got to do better than this." Because this was. I'm not talking about like in 1985. I'm talking about like in 2005. You know, I, I wasn't that late, but it was pretty late. But today, you know, you see these kind of requirements and they end up imposing very weak security. Eight bytes was probably the most common field size that you ever saw. So that's where you got the eight character password from. Was, was, that was the biggest field you could have. And today, I still go to sites that still require eight, you know, eight character max passwords. They don't allow characters. They don't allow special symbols. They don't allow any of that kind of stuff that makes what's called a strong password. And mm -hmm. it really never ceases to amaze me that, that that's still the system that we have. Uh, usually on those original systems, passwords were saved in some big text file. I mean, that was the original way that we did this. And you still see this today on Linux. Uh, Unix servers still save usernames and passwords in text files. Uh, they literally, in the oldest ones, just put a username in a column, and there was a space or some other kind of delimiter, and then there was a second column had the password. And it was in plain text. Yep. Uh, so if somebody was able to get to the file, they could literally take the file, and they had all the usernames and passwords for the entire system. And, and, that, and that was a, a very – and all, the other way they did things was writing stuff to the file. So there were old hacks where people piped. Uh, information into that file, and and once they knew what the file looked like, it was like hacking those old video games. Have you ever seen? I remember, it? I, I remember working at, at uh, another university back in 2000. We were still using Windows 95 and 98 workstations, or I shouldn't have called them that. They're just systems, and and Windows stored them right in the registry in clear text. Uh -huh. So you just went to the registry key, found out you know whatever user's password or username you wanted, and just go there and find what the password was, and there it was. I'll see your registry key and raise you a Linux boot disk. Uh, <laughs> if, on, those, on those systems, if you booted the system with a Linux boot disk, you didn't need a registry key. You could literally, if you knew where it was on the drive, which everybody did, you could just go to that, to that offset on the hard drive, and there was the password to the system. Later, they bumped it into memory, and it was still unencrypted. And then you could do memory forensics and yank down the, the buffer out of memory, and you could still see the username and password that was being used. So there was a lot of that. Uh, in the database model, they tried to make it a little bit better, but they actually in some ways made it worse because then they create, created columns uh, in a relational database, and they created another column that had a password in it, and people started dumping databases. So if you could execute a database command at the system level, once you executed that database command, you could dump all the information out of the whole system, and you could get, you could get all the usernames and passwords. And you saw people doing that all the time, and it turned into a permissions battle. So this was one of the oldest kind of hacking was a permissions battle about how could, who could get to a file, what defined execution versus read versus write, uh, and all those things added up to major problems because if I could write to the database or I could read from the database and people would say, oh, read only is good enough to protect this, I could dump all the passwords onto my screen and I could just write them down on a piece of paper. But even when they started uh, changing these models and they started storing encrypted passwords, you still had this problem because the password was in a file. There was a salt, uh, which was stored in the user file. And this is how this is done today. So there's a salt that's stored in another file called, in Linux, it's called shadow and password. And if you can get both those files off a system, it's possible to use the salt and the username and everything else that you know about it to crack the password. And so these files still become a giant problem. Um, one of the big problems uh, really in the world today then is if you store your password somewhere, and you do, and you let other people store your password somewhere, so and you do, then you're really relying on this whole long chain of problems that can be used to get access to your system. 
and to break your, your password. And they don't have to do a hack necessarily. One of the things we used to do in pen test was Cisco. So a lot of people, use, and this is no slight on Cisco because there's ways around this. It's just a slight on the security people. Cisco, if you don't do it in a better way, stores passwords in the configuration file, which is just a text file, in plain text. So if you look in a Cisco conf file, you may see username and a password right there in the plain text. Well, guess what? Half the time, that username and password is the same across every system in the company. So I got into one one time just because I could look at the Cisco stuff. I went in the closet. I plugged the console cable in. I pulled up the conf. Boom, there's the password. It says Mark, and it says the password is Sanchez. And I go, oh, okay. And I went and tried that on one of their web, their servers, and it was the same exact setup. The username was Mark, and the password, I'm making that up, but the password was Sanchez. So you can fix that in Cisco, but a lot of people didn't. So again, here's this file, and I can pull this stuff down, and if I can get it, we have a big problem. On the internet side, all of a sudden, you're using large numbers of passwords and probably the same username many, many different places, and we can tell you over and over again that you ought to have a different really cryptic username and a different really cryptic password on every single website you go to. And people find that to be pretty challenging. You know, you end up with a, with a notepad full of passwords. And we've done shows about passwords and how you need to have unique passwords and tiers of passwords and tiers of username and all this stuff on and on and on out into infinity. But the problem still remains. If you have a password and it's reused anywhere... That site, you're depending on that site and you're trusting that site not to either lose your info, which is common, sell your info because they got a rogue employee who says, you know, nobody's going to know I did this. I'm just going to dump the database and I'm going to put it out on the dark web and sell it. And if I can get money for it, why not? Um, all that, if your bank account or your credit card or whatever, use the same combo of, of username and password, somebody's going to find that information out. So where does that lead us in a long-winded uh, preface to, to the discussion it leads us to needing to do something different. And people have proposed, whether in science fiction or somewhere else, all sorts of crazy things to, to do this. But the original security model that was sort of posited was, was a three-factor, a three or what today they call multi-factor for some reason, even though it has three, but was a three-factor model uh, of something that you have something you know, and something that you are. So this was this three-factor security model that was originally posited. And the idea behind that was that now the password is sort of a pin. And the original idea of a pin number was that you already had something else. So you had a card that you had to use, and people weren't thinking about people stealing a card, and you had this pin. They didn't add that third factor to it, but they could have pretty easily. They just chose not to because people were afraid of it. So ideally, you would have a three-factor authentication that would be out there in the world. And typically, what three-factor authentication systems rely on is a password and username combination. Um, that's the something that you know, so the password. Something you have is a piece of hardware, uh, typically like a flash drive kind of gadget, and something that you are, which is typically defined as a biometric. So a biometric, of course, could be your retinas, your irises, your face, your fingerprints, your palm prints. Uh, what was the first biometric you ever saw, Russ, I mean, in real life? Uh, I mean, in science fiction, the first I saw was probably ocular scan. But, I mean, the one that I've used is um, thumbprint. The first one I ever saw in my whole life was when I was an undergraduate student at the cafeteria. They had a palm reader, mm -hmm. and I was very interested in how to get around that, and I, we found out that it was really simple. All it was doing was measuring, like, the length of your fingers on this thing. It was really simplistic, but it did kind of work, but we also found out you could get around it pretty easy by adjusting where your, your hand was and... There was all kinds of ways to beat those things. But today we see many, many different kinds of biometrics. Some are more flawed than others. Science fiction certainly presents us with things like DNA scans on the fly. Uh, that movie's called Gattaca, uh, where they, you had to put a drop of blood to get in the office and all this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. which sounded really incredibly painful after about three days of going to the door. And okay, Oh, yeah, they stuck me again. But, you know, who knows. Um, but today we're talking about two-factor authentication. So um, two-factor means that what we do is instead of just a password, what happens is I have to have a second thing. 
So I have to find a way to say a password and username is not enough. You're going to have to further validate your uh, identity somehow for this system before you can connect to it. And the idea behind it is, is the assumption that your password will be compromised. So it just becomes a kind of throwaway device. I don't really like this model, but regardless of that, I, it is something that's coming and it's something you need to be using. I don't like it because the idea that the password is then just, you know, useless is, is kind of silly. So it seems to me like there should be some better model than that. So the first ones that we see that are widely used right now are, of course, mobile phones. So... And that's an easy one, and and I like that one. If you if you sit around with your tell with your phone in your hand all the time, like a lot of people do, uh, the way this works is that when you want to log into something, you you enter your username password combination, and that is decrypted in the process on the system. They validate the encrypted password with the salt, and they 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 figure out does it match. And once they've done that, then another authentication has to occur, and that can be a text message. Uh, or even a phone call where they read you a code and then you have to type that code in. Uh, is that, I mean, is that pretty much what you're seeing, Russ? Yeah, it's, that's exactly what I'm seeing. In fact, I just, I had to reinstall Skype on a new computer today, which is why it was a minute or two late. And uh, Microsoft wanted me to uh, verify uh, that type of code uh, through my email this time instead of my cell phone. So, but I had the option to do either or. Right. So, so email is the other piece of this that they can do, which is they can send an email to your established email account. Uh, and, and by doing that, and you reply to the email, that, to me, that's a much more time consuming process than getting a text message or a phone call right. because I have to wait on that email to be generated and to come through. And, and that, I mean, it doesn't take a long time, but I'm wanting to log into that site that I got to see because that cat video is going to go away if I don't get to it right away. But uh, it is making it more difficult for someone who's stolen your username and password. So uh, to use this model as an example in a bank account. So if you log into your bank account and your username is whatever it is and your password is whatever it is, okay, if somebody steals that information, they can log into your bank account. But if you enable two-factor authentication and they steal your username and password, they buy it on the dark web, they get it from you because you accidentally gave it away to them in a, in a phishing attack or whatever, or somebody called you and said that they were going to give you a million dollars, just give us your login, um, they still, when that bank account, when they try to log in, it's going to say, I'm going to generate a text message that's going to come to your phone, and if you don't have this code, you can't get in. Now, you could still give all that up, you understand. And if you're getting fished and you're on the phone with somebody and they say, can you log into your bank account and let us share the screen, you know, that's not going to help. If, they, if you give them your username and password, if you put your username and password on a system and then they steal your phone, I mean, you know, and I, of course we can just keep going with that until we get to the point where they just take you in the basement and, and smack you around until you give up the password and the phone and no problem. But the point is, in most situations, the fact that they don't have your mobile phone or whatever mobile device or however you're doing it, at the same time as they have your username and password, mean that that transaction is going to fail. So that's why it's called two factors. So it's one thing, another thing, and if both aren't there, it's going to fail. Um, another approach to this is a flash drive key. So it, it, it can actually be a regular flash drive. You can build these yourself. But a, a really common one out in the world is called YubiKey. Russ, you, you, ever, mm -hmm. you ever use any of these? Yeah, I mean, I've seen the YubiKey being used. Um, I haven't used it myself. Um, I've also seen uh, other types of, uh, you know, like token type devices on, on USB to do the same. Uh, a lot of our military students use uh, something similar to that uh, where they have the smart card or smart chip uh, and they have to authenticate uh, using that in addition to their username and password to log into their computers. I, I agree. Uh, 20 years ago, we were, I was setting up connections for employees, and there was a lot of concern about the security of those connections, and could we validate who somebody was, and if somebody stole a laptop or whatever. And we actually purchased a bunch of uh, little dongle keys that you had to plug into a central hub inside the company, uh, I think it was once a month, and it continually got less and less accurate. It was just a timer. And it set this number that was constantly changing. And every so often, uh, if you didn't bring it into the company and plug it in, it would go bad after a while. So it just went stale and then it didn't work anymore. But YubiKey is a tiny little flash driver. They have different sizes of them. And basically, it has an encryption key stored on it. 
And that encryption key is used to then further authenticate you uh, at the same time. So you don't need that text message. I like that system because I don't like sitting with my phone in front of me. As some people do. I know I'm old and, and I don't do that. I haven't gotten into that. But uh, if you don't sit with your phone in front of you, this is a way that you can take that YubiKey or whatever, there's different ones, and plug it into a USB port and it just sits there. And all that happens is whenever you want to trigger it, you touch it and it's got a little, uh, a little copper sensor on top and you touch it, that completes a circuit and it generates that key. And that actually allows you to do a very basic kind of two-factor. YubiKeys have a lot of other features in them because they, they actually have a protocol called FIDO2 and FIDO2 has a bunch of different approaches that can be used for two-factor authentication, which can be just like really traditional stuff, like the, what we've been talking about, where it's a password and the fact that that device was triggered. But they also have things like multi-factor stuff where it can generate uh, these things that are called passwordless systems, where these, all these keys are exchanged. You can have it where it works with a biometric because uh, you, you can buy biometric devices now to put on your system at home. If you want to put a biometric, and some uh, systems actually have them. HP tried for a while. They had a thumbprint reader that was built into their laptops. Uh, I could never get mine to work. Uh, I had it. I tried it. I tried it. It would never, ever scan, and I gave up on it. Uh, they have facial recognition scanners. So if you saw some of the interviews I did with people from uh, Microsoft Ignite, they were talking a lot about their Hello technology, which... Uh, basically is a facial recognition scanner that they want to build into Microsoft uh, operating systems. So, and I think they may have put it in there now so that you can actually use that. Certainly iPhones have facial recognition built into them. So now that in, 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 in the iPhone case, they've actually gone back to a single factor. So they let you set it so that you don't have to put a password in. It's just your facial recognition and that supposedly does it. So that's, uh, that's kind of like where we are with two factor at this point. How does it work? Well, there's a couple of key things you need to be aware of if you're going to start getting into two-factor. And you need to be getting into two-factor. One is that the site you want to use has to support it. So that means that if, if you want to use a YubiKey, you want to use facial recognition, you want to use whatever, that site itself has to be built to support two-factor or multi-factor authentication. If it doesn't, I don't, all you can do is either not use the site or contact them and say, I'm not going to use your site until you put something more reasonable in place. If they're still requiring a four-digit PIN, I might be really cautious about what I put in that site. Um, you have to go to the site then and create this two-factor approach. And when you want to log in, then you're going to have to enter your password and you're going to have to have a hardware device or whatever other kind of two-factor you've done in place. Does this solve all our problems? I, I don't think so. Uh, there's a lot of issues around all this stuff in terms of people trying to beat it, ways around it. If you lose your phone and your phone has all your information on it, then you've got a problem if you lose your YubiKey and somebody's able to break your YubiKey, which is supposedly very hard to do, but I know anything's possible, then we have all that. Uh, if you give people a lot of little small things to keep up with, they're going to lose them. And then there's sort of an issue with that. So, But they do have to have all of it. So if somebody gets your YubiKey and they crack it, they still have to be able to get your other credentials, so your username and password. So there's, there's just the two factors. See, it's, it's like working in both directions at the same time. Can you break any of this? Well, of course you can. There are strategies. Uh, we looked at a lot of these strategies with corporate where we had salespeople out in the field. They had a hardware device. They had a laptop. You had to have both things together with a password. Well, guess what? Uh, we went out and looked, and about three-quarters of the salespeople had the password on a Post-it note stuck on the uh, keyboard of their laptop. The hardware device was plugged into the laptop, and we actually had a guy in Texas who got his laptop stolen, a person, he was having lunch, he had the laptop open on the table, a person came running by, grabbed the laptop, and just kept running. Uh, so they had the hardware key, they had his open system with the username and password on it, and, you know, uh, everything's fallible. Uh, so what are our recommendations for this? So we'll, we'll, we'll get down to this. Okay, recommendation one, and, and Russ can chime in with any he has. Sure. You need to be using two-factor authentication at this point. Uh, if you're using sites that don't require two-factor authentication, the only time I would say that's okay is if it's an incredibly trivial site. So if you're going to websites that are just news sites or whatever, there's no money involved, there's no credit card information being stored, there's nothing like that, it's just something completely trivial where you go to watch cat videos or whatever, and you don't give them any personal information, 
be sure that you use a unique username and password for those sites or at least one that you only use on those kind of sites. Don't use that same information on your bank account. Don't do that kind of stuff and assume it's going to be compromised. And, you know, maybe you don't need two-factor there. But on all your personal stuff that's got your personal information, you need to be using two-factor authentication. You know, you, you, Russ is nodding yes, so I'm going to say that he's... No, I, yeah, I agree completely. Um, my second recommendation was if you have a mobile device with you all the time, that method works pretty well. Uh, being able to get a text message on your phone number or through what Apple messaging or, or iMessage or whatever, or, or Android, any of those kind of things, that seems to work pretty well. It's quick. Uh, the text is sent out. Most people have free and easy texting, so we have unlimited text. We have unlimited bandwidth on our, our price per month. If you do have to pay by the text, that could get pricey. Every time you want to log into something different, you have to get another text. But that method seems to work pretty well for most people because they've got a device at hand all the time. When they need to log in, boom, they get a text message. That's two-factor authentication. I like that. If you don't mind carrying around a little flash drive and you think you won't lose it, uh, I do like the YubiKey. I find that transporting it around with me is kind of challenging because I'm afraid I'll lose it and it doesn't actually have a keyhole in it so I can't put it on my key ring and that kind of bothers me but it will go in a wallet or something so if you want to carry it with you you can certainly do that. That's probably a, a slight step up from the, the phone approach since there is a, an actual physical thing that's separate that has all kinds of crypto on it. But one of those methods should work for you. I mean, I can't believe that one of those things is not going to work for you and you need to be doing that because otherwise somebody's going to buy your password. I mean, you're going to go out in the world. Any other recommendations, Russ? Yeah, the one thing I will say uh, down, uh, downside to the YubiKey, at least as it currently stands, is um, the, the shift is now uh, in, in laptops and mobile devices to get rid of traditional uh, USB uh, type ports in favor of more high speed uh, and, and more slim form factor designs like USB C. So, uh, YubiKey kind of, or other companies that create these types of devices need to keep up with that type of technology. Because uh, it is it is very good. Uh, it is uh, more secure, in my opinion. Um, but it unfortunately, it won't work on uh, devices that don't have USB, uh, traditional USB ports. Well, that's true. So if you're using your phone a lot to log into things, uh, you know, obviously you should be able to use the two-factor authentication there. But if you've got all your usernames and passwords stored on your phone, and then you lose your phone, and somebody breaks into your phone, then none of this is going to help one bit because now you've gone really back to single factor authentication because you've got the site, the username, the password, it's all stored in here. And all they got to do to get it is be able to get past your initial login to your phone. And if they can do that, then they got everything and they can get the text messages that were meant for you. Now, obviously you can brick your phone, but that's kind of a drag to do if you, if you go out and you log out of it. Um, the other thing is, is you. You're the weakest link in this, so some cautions before you jump into this. If you're going to write your password and your username on a business card and tape your YubiKey to the business card, basically, if you leave that lying in the airport lounge, uh, well, you're pretty much done. So you'll have to go on and change all your passwords and all that kind of stuff and then get a new YubiKey. So I had somebody call me about that one not too long ago and said, I left all this stuff. What should I do? And I'm like, go in and change all your passwords. You've already done that, right? And they're like, oh, no, should I do that right away? And I'm like, well, you wrote your username and password on a card you had your YubiKey taped to the card so that you wouldn't lose it, and then you lost it anyway. And not only you lose it, you lost it with the, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, you still need to use strong passwords. You still need to use different passwords everywhere. And, and I'll once again mention, we've talked about this before, password vaulting, uh, LastPass and other tools like that. You could sponsor the show, LastPass. But uh, LastPass and other tools like that uh, are really, really reliable for this. So that means you can put the, you can generate really strong passwords. You can save them in a password vault, and that way you can uh, you can get them and you can you have it put all that stuff in for you. I like that. You can put it on your phone. You can put it on your laptop. You can put it on your desktop, and the vault is there for you. You have to log into the vault every time. You can use two-factor authentication to log into the vault. So that way, if somebody does sit down at your machine and it's already logged in they still have to have that, that other factor. So, of course, you have to remember to take that with you, too. So if you leave the key in there all the time, it doesn't really do much good. However, one big caution I want to give you. You need to, before you dive into this, you need to make a rollback plan for two-factor authentication. And, and you need to understand this, and it's a little bit complicated. 
how do you get back from this when you, A, lose your password? So what happens when you lose your password? You need to ask yourself these questions uh, before you enable two-factor authentication. What if I lose my password? How do I get back? And that can be challenging because I remember one of the earliest experiences I had with this was with uh, iTunes. And I did indeed lose a password for iTunes. And at the time, there was no recovery. The only thing they could do was delete my iTunes account and I had to create a new one. I lost everything I had in iTunes because I could not get that password back. There was no way to recover. So be sure before you lock the box that you know how you're going to recover from that. So this is the stuff you need to be reading before you do it. And people do this all the time and then they call me and they go, how do I get back here? I lost my password. Can I get back into my vault? And I'm like, did you enable that other feature where they can text your phone? No. How do you do that? And I'm like, well, you don't do it now if you lost a password. Um, how do you recover if you lose your token? So you lose your phone, you lose your login to your phone, or you lose your YubiKey. How do you recover from that? What, what occurs? Uh, I didn't even put this on the notes, but I'm going to mention this. What do I do if my biometric fails? This is, if you get excited about this and you say, I'm going to slap that biometric facial recognition on my webcam. And so every time I log into my computer, I, it has to see my face. What if your webcam fails? Do you have an extra one? Oh, I'll just order one. Oh, I can't get into my computer to order one because it's locked out. Uh, what if your phone recognition fails? Is there another way in? So Apple has, uh, you can still type in a, a, a long pin code into your Apple phone to get in. What if your fingerprint reader that you bought and put on your computer goes bad? It won't read your thumbprint anymore. It fails. How do you recover from that? How do you get back into your stuff? So before you lock it all down, be sure you know what happens when you lose the key. You know, it's not as simple as just calling a locksmith and saying, can you, can you come pick the lock on my house? It's a big jam. You can't call AAA, and you're going to have that. What happens if you lose both? This has been the most common question that I have gotten from people. I don't know my password. I lost my two-factor authentication token somewhere. I do not know how to get back into my password vault or my system. Do you have any advice? No. Um, <laughs> sorry, I don't. Um, that's a bad thing. Uh, so as you add all this security, you're going to have to come up with a plan right up front. If you lock yourself out of these services, there may be no way to get back in. There may be no way to get back to your stuff, and you may end up losing everything there. And, and I'm not saying that to keep you from doing two-factor because you need to. What I'm trying to convince you is that somewhere you ought to have a hard copy of that master key, like Apple gives you a master key. When you create an account on iTunes, they give you this big, long string. Where is your string? You go, oh, I saved it somewhere. Well, good luck finding that when you can't get in or you saved it in a folder on your computer that you can't get into now. Take that, put it in a vault somewhere. I mean, that's, that's, and that's what I do. I mean, I literally have it. It's, in, it's stored in a safe. Uh, so I have those kind of things there. So if I really, really get to that fail-safe point, I can go back and I can look that information up. Because if you don't have that, it, it's a big risk for you to jump into this stuff. You need two-factor authentication desperately, but you've got to have a plan. Russ? No, I 100% agree. That plan is critical. And in fact, we were talking about that in class today. So, you know, you got to have that plan. If you lose that key, you're in trouble. So, and, and the more security you add, the more desperately you need this plan for how do I back out of this? How do I get back in when I lock myself out? Because if you don't have those kind of plans, at some point you're going to find yourself in a rest area uh, and your car is running with the keys in it and the door locked. I know that doesn't happen with most modern cars. And you're standing there in a dark rest area in the middle of the night, and your car is running with the keys inside of it. Oh, and your phone's laying on the front seat. Not that I'm asking. That's for asking for a friend. That, that, that didn't happen to me. Uh, I do know somebody who locked their keys in the car at an ATM machine. Uh, they were like in the drive through the ATM machine, and, got, and they couldn't reach the thing. So they got out of the car to go in the ATM machine and close the door, and the door locked. And they were like, oh, what do I do now? So they sat there with people blowing the horn for two hours until AAA showed up and broke in the car. But AAA can't get into your system with two-factor authentication in place. So be sure you understand what you're putting in place. Everybody does this. They jump on there and set up a YubiKey, but they don't know how they're going to roll back from it. And when it causes all kinds of problems, you get a giant disaster. Anything else, Russ? No, I think you've done a good job. <sighs> okay, well, thank you. So thanks for joining us on Secure Digital Life this week. Uh, we hope you got something out of that. I always get something out of it because it makes me think about it too. See you next time. Bye. Bye.